that 2% number, it's really very alarming to everyone. And I am uh, not a statistician by any means, journalist by training, but it really doesn't take a huge math brain to figure out that 2% is not a great indicator. And it does indicate that something is absolutely rotten on Wall Street. And so today we're gonna discuss the funding challenges for female entrepreneurs, and I hope we'll come up with some ideas for erasing these funding disparities, um, because they lead to these persistent gender imbalances that follow all the way through um, in business. And so from, from you know, the seed capital stage to the boardrooms. And it affects the entire landscape of entrepreneurs. So I'm joined by Yana, Anino, and Sarah. So happy to have you here. So I'd like to start with Yana. So you are a founder. Tell us a little bit about your business and how it was funded. Thank you. Thank you so much, Donna. And it's an honor to be here. Thank you, everybody. And I just want to take a moment before we start to thank you for yesterday's leaders talk. And thank you for all these incredible leaders in this room for paving the way for the next generation. And I, I want to also thank you, our former president of Finland, Tarja Halonen, because what I realized yesterday during, during her talk is that I've been six when she started, when, when she started to serve as a president for Finland, and she was serving all the way until I was 18. So imagine what an environment I've been able to grow into and the example I had, and after, when I was 19, I kind of realized, okay, men can be presidents too, so <laughs> I've, I've always had that in my, so yes, that I got that empowerment from, from our country and, and the equality from there, so thank you. But I am a founder, founder of MIA, Mission Impact Academy, and uh, it's not easy to be a founder. It's the best thing I know, and it's the hardest thing I know as well. Um, MIA, Mission Impact Academy, is a global AI academy upskilling non-technical women in AI. And the future of work is being created now. The biggest question everybody always asks, will AI take over my job? And my answer is no, but a person using AI will have incredible career opportunities. So our time is now as well for women. Uh, to harness these opportunities. Uh, we have a global learning network with more than 800 women from their 60, 63 plus countries learning and innovating with AI daily. And then we have a global AI leadership program going on as well as we speak. We are seed stage. Just a year ago, we were pre-seed stage and, and starting, uh, started our fundraising journey. And it's been, I, I've learned a lot, let's put it this way. So normally seed stage, pre-seed stage is the idea stage. Seed stage is where you validate and test your idea. And uh, series A is your go to market. Uh, so in pre-seed stage, we already had a product, we had revenue and we had traction going on. We had done our first program and we had some clear example of how we had advanced these women's internal mobility by them taking our programs. But still, it wasn't, it wasn't enough. We were asked to showcase uh, a product, revenue and traction. All of these three things uh, at seed, pre-seed stage. So, um, and of course, we keep going. We're founders and we do whatever it takes for the company. So yes, we, we grow and evolve and we do all of these things. But I think in so many ways as women, we are able to show so much in advance. There's no room for innovation. We should be invested in so much earlier stages so that we can actually, we will figure it out. But if we're asked to have it all figured out, there's no room for innovation. So investment in earlier stages is so vital and crucial. We are very honored and lucky. Uh, we have incredible angel, angel investors and family offices who has believed in our potential and, and trusted that we will figure it out. And we have, now we have product, we have traction and we have revenue and we are a seed stage startup. So that is super crucial in those early stages. I think the hardest part is from zero to one. And this is like the chicken and egg situation as well. Cause if you're not ever able to go from zero to to one because you're asked all of these requirements, but if I do not have any resources to get there, what do I do? And this is creating the pipeline issue as well of not having enough of female founders because we are not supported from the early days. 
Well, let me turn to Anino. So what we are hearing from Yana is that at her very early, earliest time of funding, she was asked to provide things that most businesses would be asked for at a much later stage. Is this something um, in your experience that has been typical of female founders and what they face out in the marketplace as they try and get funding? Oh, absolutely. In fact, um, my research was on um, funding gaps for entrepreneurs. And um, I actually started working with female entrepreneurs more than 20 years ago because I found out that they weren't getting funding. And I then decided to do this research because I, I thought to myself, you know, coming from my continent in Africa, where I had lived in several countries, that if, you're not, if entrepreneurs are not getting money, and female founders have even more barriers, what is it doing to our economies? So from the perspective of economic development, it's actually a big issue when you don't have um, enough funding going to female-founded found businesses. It is crowding out the growth that we could see, so this is critically important. Um, female founders experience higher barriers than the male peers. Research has shown that. And if we look at, we talked about the 2%, and if you imagine a circle and 2% is such a tiny slither that you can almost ignore it, and that's how much money is going to female-founded ventures um, in terms of venture capitalism. Now, if you look at where that started from, it started off from uh, San Francisco and from the tech industry. And um, it came out from a very sort of, um, very male-dominated environment, and the kinds of businesses that were being funded, uh, were being founded as well. That meant that a lot of things that women that a lot of things that women were doing were not really recognised. If we look at the size of the female economy, for example, and we look at the billionaire status um, or the unicorns that have been founded by women, a lot of them have been founded on products for women. women. So all of that was crowded out. Mm -hmm. Now um, there's a bias against female uh, entrepreneurs, and some of them actually recognise them personally, and do things like take along, you know, a male, um, a male peer, a male CEO to a funding or to, to a pitching round. And uh, there was a particular research which was um, uh, in, the, in the Harvard Business Review, which actually showed that female founders were being asked different types of questions compared to male founders. Huh. And um, female founders had to justify, you know, how they were protecting the company from risk, mm -hmm. right? whereas male founders were asked questions that would showcase the opportunities. So can you imagine if you're pitching and showing how the business is not going to go to the dogs, how you know, the business is going to look after such and such a risk, it doesn't sound terribly exciting. But then when the male founder has been asked about this, he is going to conquer the world with this product and service, right? Mm -hmm. And um, by, the, by the way, this bias was both found with both um, uh, men and women who were actually behind the, you know, behind the desk you know, um, re re reviewing this. So there are all sorts of um, uh, barriers, right, that relate to um, female, uh, female founders. Yet, w by the way, this week is <laughs> Global Entrepreneurship Week, by the way, and there's a big report that is out. But when you look at the number of women or the percentage of women who um, have indicated interest in entrepreneurship, it's not that much different. It's about a sixth of men, about a quarter. So the funding gaps do not reflect the intentions to enter into entrepreneurship, and it's definitely a system that needs to be fixed. I'll stop there because I know we're going to talk about um, some of the solutions in a minute. Yeah. Well, I see Sarah nodding her head. So it seems that you may have experienced some of these, uh, these biases when you were looking for funding and as a CEO. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Absolutely. Uh, so yeah, I, I lead a company called The Lactation Network. And we are the largest provider of expert lactation care in the United States. Mm -hmm. And so we were born of the Affordable Care Act, which means that all of the care that we provide should be available to every family at zero out-of-pocket cost. No coinsurance, no deductible, nothing. But the reality on the ground is much different. And so really my organization exists to fight with health plans, to fight with insurance companies so that families don't have to and so that lactation consultants don't have to as well. And so what is one of the many really cool things about the organization that I lead is, A, of course, we're serving families in a really sensitive moment in their lives, right? The postpartum period can be 
an incredibly isolating one and frankly a lethal one and those numbers are headed in the wrong direction in the United States. So of course that is an unbelievable problem and an unbelievable challenge to be part of trying to solve. And of course, all of the lactation consultants we work with across the country, we're in all 50 states working with thousands of LCs. They are all female entrepreneurs. Every single one has started their own private practice. And so to be able to support them and the growth of their practices, I mean, it's a dream job, what I get to do. And so to your point about funding, you know, I do have experience raising funds at the private equity level. So expanding on your point, um, for the uninitiated, private equity is really designed for companies that are in a later stage of growth. They're not early stage startups. They've got their feet under them. They've got a concept. They brought a product to market and they're looking for funding support and strategic support. Support. And I was nodding my head at your remarks because I think, you know, first of all, I think there, there's such a confidence bias that, that investors have, but I think also generally, especially in the United States, that if you come in and you say something with conviction, people believe you, right? Whereas in my experience and in my view, the most thoughtful leaders are the ones who aren't always sure that they're right. And I think that there, there's a bias against that in a way that's really unfortunate and it often cuts against women. So that, that is certainly my experience in, in being at the table with, with funders who, of course, I'm very often the only woman in the room as well. So I want to turn back to Yana again and ask, so we heard that horrible 2% number, but I actually realize that it's worse for emerging tech. And that's your space. Why is this such a problem? Well, yes, so the 2% is shocking, we all know that, but in terms of investment going to female funders in emerging technologies and especially in AI, the number last year was 0.4%. So it's, it's even worse. And why this is so urgent and so timely and we need to do something about it now, because I always compare that AI, the technology itself, is a three-year-old toddler learning from its environment, from its users, from its creators, from its builders, from, from everybody who's implementing and innovating with that technology at the moment. And we do not have enough of diverse representation building with those technologies. And we do not have enough of female innovators and founders building with those technologies at the moment because we do not have the funds going to these female founders as well. And there's the same chicken and egg situation from zero to one if they do not even have access to capital because they are asked to come back when you have the products, when you have this and this to figure it out. But if you don't, do not have the resources to figure those early questions out, so that, yeah. there we are. But we need to do urgently something about it now because the, the, the speed is so fast. Right, and the, the biases are going to be built into the technology if we don't have Exactly, women. even more is being built already, so it's going to, yeah, it, it keep on building. It's going to exacerbate those problems. And, you know, can you tell me anything about the differences between the types of businesses that women are bringing forward versus the, the male entrepreneurs and whether that is contributing in any way to the bias? Well... In fact, when we look at you know, the role of business right, in the economy, first of all, why this is really important, if you look at the biggest companies in the world, you know, and the, the Fortune 500 companies, um, there's been a massive shift in the last 20 years. And that is to say that um, a high percentage of them, if not most of them, are actually businesses that are relatively new. And these businesses are shaping our lives, shaping the ways in which we consume products, shaping the wealth distribution. And so it's actually contributing to an increasing the wealth gap, right, by not having access to, fu to funding that can uh, grow businesses. But to speak to that question directly, yes, there is um, a bit of a difference because it's in leadership. Women tend to be, um, tend to be inclusive, more inclusive. So uh, the risk is, without funding female-led businesses, you're not funding inclusive businesses. And look at the state of the world of capitalism right now. Do we really want to continue in that direction? When we look at emerging technologies, if you look at AI and look at what women are doing in AI and the voice of women in AI, we know that we need to have inclusive uh, leadership in AI. AI is going to shape the ways in which we do just about everything. It is already involving, it's already involving biases being built into the system. 
and we need so desperately to have female voices in there leading and developing and creating um, you know, products right, in that sector. So it's critically important that we actually have the funding to female-led ventures because the impact on society economies or female-led businesses is certainly to do with world creation, but it's also to do with um, inclusive, inclusive, um, growing inclusive economies. It's also got to do with shaping the future for the world that we all want to live in. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, so we are going to probably have a pipeline problem uh, in terms, of what, which we already see, of course, in terms of getting women onto boards. Are you seeing any of, I mean, how do people respond? How do male fu funders respond when you start talking to them about lactation? First of all, do they know what it is? <laughs> <No>. <laughs> No, uh, yeah, we spend a lot of time really defining the problem that we solve and the moment that families are in. And I think, you know, so much of the suffering that we are aiming to alleviate is silent. And so I think I, I carry that responsibility seriously. Um, sometimes we have dads, of course, and, and I think that, you know, the reality is that a new baby happens to a whole family. Mm -hmm. And so to a certain extent, a lot of them know exactly what I'm talking about, but many, of course, mm -hmm. do not. Are they able to make the connection between what you do and profitability? <laughs> I have to draw a pretty straight line in general. Um, but yeah, you know, I think one of the interesting things about ever being in a room, you know, with folks who are looking at what you're doing and, and trying to vet it, and I think that especially this is something that, that women should remember is you're never going to be invited to second guess yourself so constantly as when you're, you're looking to raise money for your company. You know? And I think as you go into that process, making sure that you have the right support system around you, right? choosing the right investment bank, if that's the route you're going to go, but also having folks who've done what you're trying to do makes such an unbelievable difference. Because I think that, again, you know, you're, you're going to question all of the skills <clears throat> and all of the excellence that resides in you that got you to where you are. Mm -hmm. And you're going to think, God, I have no idea, and they know my business better than I do. I think that's such a common refrain, knowing that going in and having people who can support you in doing that, and ideally women who have done the same thing, I think is absolutely game-changing. I'm hearing female entrepreneur alliance right here. <laughs> so we only have three minutes left. So in our three minutes, I'd love to talk about some solutions. So I'm gonna start with the two of you. Yana first, give me some practical ways that we can approach cr closing this gap, helping more women entrepreneurs get from zero to one. Perfect. And it can be very simple, little things, but it means a world to us. Buy our products, test our products, share our social media posts, invite us to conferences like this, and when you get a door open, invite another one. And I've got so much incredible support from other founders as well, because we are in the same boat. So a little support can make a huge difference. But then also investors who are believing on our potential and, and funding us in early stages, those are the ones that, that, gonna, that, that we really need. In, in the journey and, and super grateful for them. Okay, Sarah, what are you thinking? I'm thinking look for female check writers, right? When you're looking at ideal funding targets, also consider it, again, as I mentioned, when you're choosing an investment bank. Um, I think that that perspective is one that's gonna matter so much as you look for a funder, you know, everything changes the minute that deal closes, right? And the minute that the check is cut. And so making sure that you're finding the right partner going forward and folks who are gonna take you seriously. And there aren't enough female check writers, of course this is true, but keep an eye out for the ones that are out there. Yeah. Okay, so we've heard some practical solutions. And you know, let me turn to you. Are there policies? What, how can governments step in, international organizations? What policies could we have? I think, first, uh, first of all, let's look at it from the perspective of um, an economic imperative, which is what it is. Um, I think that the conversation tends to sound like social or some kind of justice. That is to say, um, women need to have equal rights. Of course, women need to e have equal rights, but it's actually an economic imperative. And we've seen governments move when they have seen that things are really important um, economically. The SBA, for example, in the US, which I think was formed in the 70s or 80s, came out of that, you know, out of um, some uh, um, recession. And there was, it was clear that the government had to be involved in financing smaller businesses. 
There was a similar thing in, um, in the UK as well, where the, where the Bank of England monitored for about 10 or 11 years and had meetings with commercial banks about funding to smaller businesses and entrepreneurs. And that report went out annually until it was clear that there wasn't a systemic funding gap. If governments look at female-led businesses and realize that it's also an economic imperative. There are certain policy measures that can happen. Once you monitor what people are doing, you engage um, the people who have capital into conversations, things can change. So there's a role for policymakers. But there's something that I think that um, we often don't realize when we talk about venture capitalists. Venture capitalists don't really own the money. Who owns the money? They are investing on behalf of people who own the money. And very often, the biggest um, uh, funders tend to be pension funds. So the money that all of you are earning, right, from your jobs, going into pensions, from um, civil servants, from nurses, doctors, schools, everything, these funds are the ones very often that are going into venture capitalism or venture, cap um, uh, venture capital. So we need to look at, at, at them, actually, and say to those investment managers that the choices that you're making, are you looking at the portfolios and where's the money going to? And the money needs to go to women. So also, I think we need to look at, um, pay attention to that, the real source of funds, that's where the power is, and also um, government to stepping in, not to fund, but to um, basically uh, speak to that ecosystem and research it and monitor it, and I think we'll begin to see, see things happen. But right now, it's not looked at uh, really holistically as an intervention into the whole system. Okay. Well, thank you, Yana. Thank you, Anino. Thank you, Sarah. What a wonderful discussion. Um, you heard it here f first, folks. You need to vote with your money, you know, put your money into female entrepreneurs. <laughs> thank you so much for paying attention, and uh, see you next time. Thank you. Thank you.